I want to say welcome to everybody. My name is Adrian Jeanette. I am the curator at the Brunier Art Museum of the University Museums at Iowa State. And first of all, thank you all for making the change to this program being virtual. Uh, you know, kind of a last minute shift. Welcome to the time of COVID. We're all doing that all the time, but we're really, really happy and that we can still continue and have this lecture um, with, with Dr. Casamayor Cisneros. I think it's gonna be really amazing. So I just want to say also thank you to Kathy and John Howell, the Art Enrichment Program, who, who donated the funds for us to be able to host programs like this and lectures. And that um, everyone just please keep themselves muted and their videos off if they can during the talk, the lecture. Uh, hopefully we'll have time for some question and answer. So if anyone has any questions um, at the end of the lecture, please feel free to add it into the chat. Um, you can also unmute yourself if you really want to uh, that way, but it's probably easier through the chat function. And lastly, the Arte Cubano exhibition should be open for a couple more weeks. It's actually gonna be extended to November 21st. Uh, and we're open Wednesday through Friday from 10 to four and Saturday and Sunday from one to four. So first of all, I also, or sorry, last of all, I wanna say thank you to Dr. Casamayor Cisneros for agreeing to this wonderful lecture. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. And we have a special um, introduction by Lucia Suarez, Dr. Lucia Suarez, who's director of the US Latino Studies um, program here at Iowa State and an associate professor of Spanish who can be with us today, even though she's in New York because she's off this semester. So we're really happy to have her. So I'm gonna change it over to Lucia and we will go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. And I first want to thank Adrian Jennett, Alicia Amber, and the Brunier Art Museum at Iowa State University for bringing the exhibit Arte Cubano. It's a fantastic, eye-opening, and inspiring collection. Gratitude also for bringing important critical conversations to the university and our many intersecting communities with Dr. Coco Fusco and Dr. Casamayor Cisneros. Second, Today, I am truly pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Odette Casamayor Cisneros, a cosmopolitan, globally relevant intellectual who received her BA in journalism from the University of Havana in her native country, Cuba, an advanced degree from the University of Bourgogne, a master's and a doctoral degree from the Ecole des Hautes-Études en Sciences Sociales in France. Her intellectual peregrinations landed her here in the US Northeast over 15 years ago as one of the leading scholars in Cuban and Afro-Cuban studies. Her book, Utopia, Dystopia, and Ethical Weightlessness, Cosmological Reconfigurations in Post-Soviet Cuban Fiction, examines the literary production and existential void experienced by Cubans after the collapse of the socialist bloc in the 1990s. I would say that it's a must read for anyone interested in deeply understanding post-Soviet revolutionary Cuba. She is a creative writer, author of Una Casa en los Catskills. No translation yet, but we're waiting for that. She has been regaled with prestigious international literary awards such as the Juan Rulfo International Essay Award in Paris and the Jose Juan Arrom National Literary Essay Prize by the Union of Cuban Writers, UNIAC. And I should say it's no small feat to get such a prestigious award in Cuba. Dr. Casamayor Cisneros' academic and journalist work informs my own thinking and teaching. She is both an accomplished ivory tower scholar and a public intellectual. More recently, I have valued her op-ed in Truth Out, and I, the title is, My Heart Aches for Cuba, and I Yearn for More Solidarity from the Global Left. In this piece, she provides a balanced political lens that is personal and sociological about the protests against the Cuban government started on July 11, 2021 in Havana and shared insights like Miami and West New York for different reasons. She laments the halt in daily conversations with her mother and asked the world to examine the shortcomings of blaming all the malaise of the Cuban economy on the US embargo, when in fact, the Cuban government also has a stronghold in the game. Rethinking Cuba from a more complex perspective, she asked us to reinterpret the Cuban condition in both political and humanistic terms. Thus, I would add for Americans, Cuba might seem like an inexplicable enigma formulated by contradictions as the brochure catalog for this exhibit suggests. But in fact, there are very many, very clear explanations of its people, literary and artistic production. Today's talk, The Cuban Gaze, Understanding Cuba Through Its Contemporary Visual Arts will provide us with a nuanced glimpse of this dynamic. 
So, gracias. Thank you, Doctora Casamayor Cisneros, for being with us today here via Zoom. And without further ado, welcome and thank you. So uh, I want to say now that everything is on track. I want to say, uh, well, first, good afternoon. And thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, to my dear colleague and uh, friend, Professor Lucia Suarez for this generous introduction. And to the Iowa State University Museums for inviting me to give this talk today. To, to give this talk today. Particularly, I want to recognize the understanding of the museum administrators and the curator, Adrian Granite, that smoothly made the transition to a virtual event. I really wish I could be in person with you today, but being unable to travel at this moment, I really appreciate your flexibility and diligence in reorganizing so quickly this event. In sum, I have no words to express how thrilled I am by this opportunity to talk about contemporary Cuban arts. And uh, I am also happy that uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Lucia Suarez, she talked about the uh, Cuban protest in Cuba uh, on July, that they started on July 11th, about uh, past July 11th, July 11th, because I actually want to start in this lecture, remembering the Cuban protest initiated, initiated at that moment, and ex exactly with this video that I hope you will be able to watch. The past July 11th, thousands of Cubans joined to peacefully protest in the streets throughout the island. They were calling for the better governmental solution on the COVID crisis. At that moment, Cuba was the fifth country with more cases per capita in the world, as well as for reliable access to food, electricity, and medicine, all of which has been in short supply on the island. I wonder if you are, are you uh, able to listen to me? I'm sorry. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, excellent, thank you. you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. It's so, so difficult I, <laughs> in this way. So 
um, we have to recall that um, at that moment, Cuba was the fifth country with more cases per capita in the world as well. Uh, so at that moment, they were also, the Cubans were also um, asking for more reliable access to food, electricity, and medicine, all of which have been in short supply on the island as a, as a direct consequence of the US embargo imposed since 1960. And of course, the Cuban internal economic policy. But Cuban protesters did not only ask for the improvement in their lives, they also asked for freedom of speech and for political reforms. As we could hear and saw in the images of the protests spread by, via social media. Their claims, however, were, were met by a shocking and harsh response from the government. Current, current Cuban president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, that uh, you saw in the video, didn't respond with an openness to dialogue, as one could expect in a socialist society that is, and I would quote, of the humble, with the humble, and for the humble. Those were the worst by its leader, Fidel Castro, when he announced in this, uh, this in, in the social uh, when he announced the socialist declaration of the revolution on 1961. But the Cuban current president, Q, uh, current Cuban president, instead responded by ordering the, uh, by the violent repression of its own people. Hundreds of Cubans have been detained and convicted in quick tri trials. Some have been even uh, some have been even deported. And cybersecurity measures intended to restrict the use of social media and the internet have been enforced. On the American side, the Biden administration pledged support for Cuban dissidents while imposing additional sanctions against the island. Against the, island. the Cuban protests of, of last summer constitute a watershed. They are massiveness and ubiquitousness, ubiquitousness been unique for the Cuban society since the triumph of the revolution in 1959. In general, we can say that this was an outbreak of profound and unbearable discontent experienced through, uh, through years by Cubans, a situation that we can describe using the analogy of a pressure cooker. This is indeed a very complex situation obscured by decades of disinformation and lack of knowledge on Cuban realities, which derives from the harsh politics of the Cold War. This void of information has been filled by political propaganda from both the Cuban and the US governments, but rarely we have been able to hear the voices of the, Cuban, the Cubans living on the island. Counteracting this situation, the, the protests that started on July 11th offered the unique opportunity to finally hear these Cuban voices. However, similar opportunities to understand Cuba through, through, um, um, through unofficial lenses have been provided since the 1980s by some Cuban artists. Particularly visual and performance artists have through the years offered internal, very critical views on the complexity of the existence, the existence on the island. Connecting the present and the past of the Cuban socialist revolution, Cuban artists engage in current political debates, clearly denouncing and counteracting, in many cases, government censorship. That's why I am inviting you now to approach that Cuban game in an exercise of deconstructing of, of deconstructing self-representation, the self-representation processes enacted as Cubans by the artist Fisher in the exhibition Arte Cubana. And let's start with this piece, Ser Cultos para Ser Libres, Be Culture to Be Free by Sandra Ramos. Not only because of the power of this portrait of the artist as a Cuban school girl, a, a, a recurrent image throughout her work, but also because of the title. Ser cultos para ser libres. Actually, Jose Martí 
what he wrote in 1884 was Ser Cultus el Unico Modo de Ser Libre. And this, um, the 19th century Cuban patriot, Jose Marti, and actually founding father of the nation, um, wrote, as I said, wrote this, um, this phrase in 1884, but the phrase has been adapted by the Cuban revolutionary government to articulate and promote its undoubtedly effective educational policies. We cannot forget that since it's, in, it's inception, the Cuban revolution that in 1959 inherited an illiteracy rate of approximately 30%, which was um, the, four, the fourth highest rate in Latin America, but they had uh, the eradication of illiteracy as a major goal, a goal that was successfully accomplished in December 1961. Cuban education for the war has been at the center of official policies and the revolution identity, identity for years. But 40 years after, after this indisputable achievement, the artist Sandra Ramos and many others of her, of her generation ask if education to which the revolution has consistently allocated considerable, considerable, considerable resources and energies is enough to keep Cubans free. At the same time, her piece questions Jose Marti's uh, preachments and by extension, the totality of his ideology, which has been maintained as an ancillary pillar of the revolutionary and national ideologies. Other fundamental interpretations arise as we examine Ramos' representations of this pionera, the sculptor, um, this Cuban girl that is lying as if she was sleeping in a black sea and imprisoned by a row of dancers. The use of her island-shaped uh, self-portrait within a jail of pencils also constitutes, um, constitutes an unmistakable and elaborate reference to the sense of isolation experienced by Cubans living in a besieged, sometimes even uncommunicated island that for several decades remained isolated in the Western Hemisphere. As Cuba was banned, for, was banned for, its, for instance, from the Organization of American States in 1962, the socialist island became a Soviet satellite in the Caribbean. Its allies, the socialist bloc were thousands of miles away in East Europe, while its neighbors repelled the island as an enemy. But Sandra Ramos' images, image can be at the same time interpreted as an, an in a palimpsestic manner with the famous poet, la, poem La Isla en Peso that I am reproducing right here at the bottom of the, of the slide. La Isla en Peso, the whole island, written in 1943 by the great Cuban poet, poet Virgilio Vignera. He wrote, La maldita circunstancia del agua por todas partes, the curse of being completely surrounded by water. And um, so isolation and sense of desperation of the island, Islander are not exclusively feelings, exclusive feelings of present day Cubans. Those feelings are linked to a history of dependence and underdevelopment whose roots have to be found in colonial times. And in addition to the historical geopolitical factor of our Caribbean insularity, the everyday pressure exerted by the US embargo is certainly present, present in these images, as it is in the island quotidian existence. The image of the pionera to convey Cuban geopolitical constraints is a recurrent trope that also reappears in works by other artists, such as in Duvier de Davos, his uh, Teoria and pra um, Teoria y y Practica, Theory and Practice. In this piece, the young school girl in uniform seems absorbed in understanding the intricate functioning of something. 
she could be a paradigmatic image of the Cuban youth becoming free uh, through their education, becoming the new Cubans whose contours were outlined as El Hombre Nuevo, the new man, by Che Guevara in his 1965 pamphlet, Socialism and Man in Cuba. But in Duvier, uh, Duvier Delgado's piece, between the pionera and, the, um, and her object of a study, obstructing her view, there is this image, which is uh, Fidel Castro. The piece certainly addresses the ideological interfer interference, how even science could be and it is shaped by ideology, by ideology in the Cuban context. This work has also certain reminiscence, reminiscence of uh, socialist realism aesthetics, alluding to the economic, political, and ideological Soviet hegemony over Cuba, particularly between the declaration of the socialist, socialist character of the revolution in 1961 and the collapse of the socialist system in the, 1960, in the 1990s. Thus, post-coloniality and dependence from metropolis whether it was uh, Spain until 1898, the United States until 1959, or the Soviet Union until its dissolution in 1991, or more recently from tourism or Venezuela's oil are also recurrent themes in contemporary Cuban arts. I also would like to address the, sig the significance of the gender perspective and the discussion of gender issues in contemporary Cuban society. It is, in this regard, worthwhile to consider the use of the feminine imaginary to counteract masculinity, virility, and the ever-present machismo, the machismo prevailing in official Cuban history, Cuban nationalistic discourses, and power. Female artists, often artists, oftentimes use their own bodies as expressive media, as it is in the case of the photographic pieces by Katiuska Saavedra Leiva and Litsis Alvisa, which I just uh, um, projected. In their works, the female body appears a site of resistance to societal rules, where the desire might convey or some agency that evades political hegemony and patriarchal domination, where experiences leaves an indelible trace. As following in this, uh, in, in this case, uh, in, the, in the title of Alvisa series, The Traps of the Interior, The Traps Within Ourselves. With a heavy sense of uncanniness, these reproductions, these reproductions of the female body uh, by young women artists are very different from the use of the images of women in Roberto Favelo's works, a consecrated, almost canonical figure of contemporary Cuban art. In Favelo's magical image, there is no uncanniness, but unescapable eroticism and baroque fabulation of the female body. It might be also important to notice that Favelo's images are, or, or works are painted or sculpted. Lyricism and fantasy being thus supported by the chosen medium of expression. While Alvisa and Saavedra privilege the use of photographic work in which they introduce the symbolic and allegoric aspects that at the same time that invade the spectator with uncanniness and act powerful criticism of gender stereotypes. Also, in the work of the young women artists, we are not allowed to see their faces. The presence of their bodies is indeed powerfully felt, but it is not eroticism what emanates, emanates from them. It is rather the intimate experience, for it is the flesh, that what comes to talk to us from these words. We feel here plain womanhood without the need of showing faces or breasts. In traps of, of interior, for instance, the first um, image, we can only see the back of the artist. And in verse, 
in hand, which is the second one, the views are restricted to the level in which the nipples would start. Meanwhile, in Favela's words, it is precisely their faces and breasts what, we, what is presented at the center of, as the center of attraction. In the sculpture, the first image, the sculpture domestic prayer, kitchen utensils are placed on the woman's head, creating a complicated coiffure what, what, uh, and alluding to the traditional role of the domestic real. Uh, so her tradition, traditional role in the domestic real. But the wings on her back suggest that she maintains her also a stereotyped, a stereotyped role as a muse bringing a dream allure to the piece. These wings, however, seems to be attached to her body with ropes, which makes more prominent her breasts at this, at, in a clear allusion to a stereotyped, again, erotic image. Similar ropes are found in the second piece, the canvas title uh, Memories, in which the woman now carries another image of herself with wings and red high heels. But I would like now to go, to go back, to go back now to the discussion about geopolitical determination of the Cuban existence. How history, underdevelopment, dependence, and socialist ideology have conditioned today's life on the island. It is certainly a context dominated by complex and oftentimes conflictual dualities and unkept promises. And this context uh, informs political, uh, arti sorry, artistic production. Some of the artists presented or exhibited in Arte Cubano have been exhibited since the uh, 1980s and the 1990s. Other works are more recent, but in general, they respond in one way or another to the profile of the Cuban cultural media described here in this phrase now uh, on the screen by the well-renowned Cuban critic Gerardo Mosquera, uh, where he says, and I will, well, actually, well, I will read it. I call the crop of, of new artists of the 90s, El Wit, and they were able to multiply under extremely, extremely difficult circumstances. As they flourished, they continued the existence of the new art movement. Um, I'm sorry, the continued existence of the new art movement was, was secured after the, indiscrim the indiscriminate diaspora at the beginning of this decade. The movement also conserved the, in, the intensity of the cultural scene. And really, I want to highlight this part. These young people are the artists of post-utopia and crisis. Although they have to act in the, in the situation of mere subsistence prevailing on the island, and I think he's the first year to this special period, um, they conserve more some of the avant-garde spirits of the previous decade. They continue this movement in the paradox of present processes where socialist fundamentalism is paralleled by an opening towards foreign capital. Just as bureaucracy is paralleled by neoliberalism, the authoritarian system by commercialization and sex tourism, ideological rhetor um, um, rhetoric by cynicism. The population survives thanks to corruption, motivated by subsistence rather than enrichment and supplies sent by exiled family members. In the midst of this situation, the artists act in an ambiguous vacuum around a power pyramid that is only capable of reproducing itself. Their belief in utopia was be, has been decli declining uh, just like they are bred Regions. And I think this is so symptomatic of what is happening in Cuba right now and was written in 1999 that I, that's why I wanted to go slowly through. So those artists inheriting scarcity, uncertainty, uncertainty and uprooting um, 
the, which are the main features of the crisis open in Cuba after the collapse of the socialist system in the 1990s, uh, what, uh, as I said, uh, has been commonly known as the special period. Um, so these artists now had to invent new narrative to address the difficult times on the island. And transgression is a permanent feature on these words. Uh, this transgressive, the, the transgressive uh, quality has to be considered within a very complex relationship with government censorship. In fact, in every mind, through generations, remains the warning, um, um, the warning heard, I will say, by uh, Fidel Castro during his infamous Palabras a los Intelectuales, words to the intellectuals, in, of, of 1961. Mm -hmm. Dentro de la revolución todo, contra la revolución nada. The frightening effect of Castro's words are behind the balancing act with the power in which contemporary our Cuban artists are always immersed. A dangerous dance that might, that, might end, that might end not only with censorship, but also with punishment, intimidation, incarceration, or deportation. As it has been the case uh, recently of the young, uh, the young dissident artist, Hamel uh, Navastida. After suffering a prison time, home arrest, blackmail, and police harassment for over three months, just on, the same, on September 25th, La Bastida, Hamlet La Bastida and his partner, uh, the writer Catherine Disquette, without being allowed to say goodbye to their families and friends, were sent to Poland, to Poland on a one-way trip. Testing the limits of their freedom, artists have to, have to find original ways to circumvent omnipresent censorship by, for instance, recurring to non-specific Cuban references to, to address pressing current national issues, such as in the case of the, 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 uh, the work I am showing right now, uh, Pinocho, in, uh, Pino, Pinocho y Napoleón Cuentan la Historia uh, by Estéreo Segura. So here it is, the hybrid creature of Pinocchio and Napoleon, allegories uh, to fantasy and power, also expressing how history is a product, how it is constructed and perpetrated by legendary masculine figures. A suggestion confirmed when we notice, and fortunately for those that are um, right now uh, at the museum, you can go and see, um, so this is, uh, this is confirmed when we notice that this strange bronze sculpture has been installed on a stack of history books. History is thus supported by the many lies that we find in the narratives of political empire. And these lies can travel very long distances, becoming universal as suggests the rocket placed uh, at the end of Pinocchio's nose. So we go back now to um, the words by uh, Cuban poet Virgilio Piñera, the same poem, La Isla en Peso, in which he also wrote, El agua me rodea como un cáncer. Nadie puede salir, nadie puede salir. Um, and these verses uh, travel through Cuban history. I repeat, it, they were wrote, uh, written in 1943, uh, but they come to the present. They go through Cuban history and they come to the present. We go back to this idea, nobody can escape, uh, where desperation is clearly recreated, as if they were referring to the contemporary sense of suffocation and frustration experienced by many Cubans that have, that have chosen but the, the uncertainty of exile, even risking their lives. So some of the pieces uh, exhibited in the Arte Cubano aim to convey this uh, terrible drama of, Balse of the Balseros, the, the raptors, 
although, and actually I'm going back first. Um, although we have first, that's why I came back to this image, to this slide. We have first to understand the particularities of the different ways um, uh, um, the, Cuban the Cuban diaspora diaspora is not monolithic. And uh, is, I, I, I am also, I am just um, summarizing here the three main waves. The one in the 1960s, the 1980s, Maria, which was mostly the first one, the 1960s was mostly a political one. The 1980s, which was the Mariel, La Crisis del Mariel, El Mariel um, Bodnik, and the 1994. Uh, which I put here in red because this is actually the crisis to which uh, the artisan Artequano are, um, are referring to. So the 1994 uh, Rafter crisis or La Crisis de los uh, ba, um, Balseros is uh, substantially different to the others. And, um, so, and in particular, um, so they refer to this one just as so the 1990 war, uh, 1994 uh, Crisis de los Balseros uh, as shows this uh, piece by um, Cascio. You know? um, uh, and uh, well, the crisis de los balseros, uh, uh, de los balseros, or the after crisis, uh, is the this um, exodus of some thirty-five thousand Cubans to the United States via uh, those makeshift uh, rats, wow. and they they were fleeing the extremely uh, difficult economic conditions on the island. That's why. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, substantially different from the two uh, previous um, waves. Um, so the works here, as I say, um, and uh, the whole exhibition, so those that reflect the, the uh, um, diasporic desperation, um, can be considered as uh, tentatives to transmit this sense of hopelessness of a whole nation, of the people seeking to find a better life by leaving the island. So a piece like this one, um, um, or uh, yes, like yes, like this one, propellers is that one, no, it's the other one, by uh, Casho suggests the precariousness um, of the rafts and the fragility of the dreams um, of a dream of, of, of escaping, of uh, those um, of, of being able to reach uh, the United States or a better life. And a similar message uh, of illusionism and disappointment somehow can be read in a stereo segura serigraph, um, hybrid of the Chrysler, so, um, which, um, or Chrysler hybrid. Um, and this particular image is called uh, Todos Quieren, so it's titled Todos Quieren Volar. And I am accompanied, so what you have in the exhibition is the first one, just the serigraph. But I am uh, accompanying uh, the serigraph, uh, so the drawing, <clears throat> by one of the installations uh, with the same name, with the same title, that Segura has been creating for years. Uh, I have to say that, that Estereo Segura is uh, a passionate collector of vintage uh, American cars. Uh, those cars that uh, from, from the 1940s and 1950s that are currently uh, so common in Cuba and remain in use um, thanks to, the, to Cubans' limitless inventiveness. But the Chryslers, Chrysler, sorry, Chrysler here depicted uh, is a, is a, high, a hybrid um, of a plane. And again, we have here this sense, the use of hybridity in Segura's work. So remember, it's the same artist that did this uh, hybrid of Pinocchio and uh, Napoleon. But here, Segura's uh, hybridity connects with a such Cuban creativity and sense of imagination provoked by difficult economic conditions with the Cubans' desire and dream for another life, to escape the harsh reality, which is ultimately an universe, uh, universal desire, as Segura explains here in this, um, in this um, phrase that I am not going to read, it's too long. <laughs> So Estereo Segura has titled this uh, particular play, uh, piece, 
the one that we were um, watching before, uh, todos quieren volar, and I insist. And uh, our question might be, why everyone wants to fly, engaging in a perilous crossing of the waters, sometimes defying death. With these words, both Asterio Segura and Casio succeeded in catching the drama, the urgency and despair of the Cuban people. Just as the poignant tragic image uh, um, in, in, this, in this piece, this photograph by Alain Pino, uh, Escape, uh, Escape 3. Um, so this image, Escape 3, does the same. So it's trying to capture the ultimate expression of the will to migrate. When crafts, uh, rafts or boats are not in all, and uh, only the body remains as a, as, a, as a means to escape. I would like to continue with this very particular piece in which participated the artist over here, um, the, his wife at that time. And uh, well, behind you have again the author, the artist, and uh, their daughter. I don't know if the uh, image is, um, is, is enough, but it's not. Well, you, you at least you have the museum. Uh, and here we have, a, so they are all together in this uh, interesting, highly suggestive game of trompe This installation, while introducing reflections on family, marriage, the nature and faithfulness in relationships, also addresses the, the limits and intersections of art um, and, um, and the public, and the public, the discourse and the image, reality and its narration. This works, um, um, so this work projects also many interrogations to the public. We seem to be asked, for instance, where is the truth? And who are the actors and the viewers? Where are we as public within this delicate entanglement? We, uh, this immersive and also, uh, um, where are we are within this immersive, immersive and an all-absorbing trampoline. Here it is evident how the self-referential is used as a strategy to see and to be seen, as a way to enact performative acts in which the artist, the image, and the public become inter interchangeable. So from different backgrounds and ethic aesthetics perspectives, the, work ex the works exhibited in Arte Cubano intersectionally address multiple issues of insularity, nationhood, diaspora, womanhood, heroism, and, and masculine, masculine and masculinity, sexuality, politics, and the production of national history. Then, what could have been, what could be, um, what could be still missing in such a diverse and complete overview of contemporary Cuban life? Think through the lenses of the works exhibited in Arctic One. Maybe, in my opinion, the discussion, I would say that it would be the discussion of inequalities on the island, particularly racial inequality. That's why, even though we have this impacted, Im impacted image, I image, the first one, uh, which is included in the, um, on the exhibition, um, no. This image of the black man picture by Alan Pino no. No. in El Tiempo Pasa. Uh, I wanted to bring also in contrast this uh, this other piece, Cuidado, I Negro, Beware of the Black Man by Manuel Arena. Here, the artist's self portrait functions as a, as a warning, pointing out his supposed dangerousness as a black artist expressly denouncing racial inequalities and discrimination in Cuba, which shouldn't remain unnoticed, need proper, needs proper recognition in exhibitions of the contemporary Cuban art. In conclusion, even if it is only 90 miles south of Florida, 
Cuba remain, still remains an enigma for most, for most Cubans. And decades of disinformation and Cuban realities have fermented resilient um, misconceptions on all sides of the political spectrum. The, the Arte, Cuba, Arte Cubano exhibition contributes to filling that void, offering an exceptional opportunity to understand the socioeconomic, political, ideological, and cultural problems that shape Cubans' everyday experience. At the same time, the works brought, the works brought, to get, brought together in this exhibition are all united in the most profound, contextual, and aesthetic irreverence. The artists being ostensibly at odds with all form of forms of canonicity and tradition in artistic production. So while enjoying the exquisiteness of the works here exhibited, it is now our task to proceed to this kind of exercises the deconstruction of the Cuban gaze, the understanding of the whole diverse, too complex, ever-changing island through its contemporary arts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, I'm going to see, does anyone have a question? You can type it into the chat function or uh, unmute yourself if you like, or if there's anyone in the museum that has a question, please let us know. Okay, so <laughs> I have a question. Um, you know, thinking about what's happening right now is really interesting for me. Oh, Lucia has a question, but We'll get Lucia first before I can. Can you speak more on the issue of the representation of the female body in Cuban art? Yes. That's so, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, where does that? Um, well, I think that this is something really interesting. So thank you, Lucia, for your question. And actually, I want to start uh, apologizing <laughs> for the, um, from the technical problems I had at the beginning. I really, um, it wouldn't happen if I was there with you as well. So uh, I hope that at least you got something <laughs> from my presentation. Well, um, Lucia, thank you for your question. And um, I would say that um, it's very interesting the fact that we have many um, women, are, uh, of so, um, women, great artists in Cuba throughout our history, no? not even after 1959, but after 1959, it has been uh, increased the number of uh, um, um, uh, female artists, but even before. But unfortunately, the um, patriarchal organization, let's we'll say, or structure, structures of um, Cuban, not only um, um, cultural institutions or cultural groups, but even the nation, how it is uh, built, um, has somehow obscured the, uh, the work and more importantly, the message of our um, great women artists. And I am thinking about uh, Amelia Pelaez back in the 1940s, 1950s, and how she somehow, so what, what was uh, taken into account from her work was mostly this uh, um, area of uh, the el, el hogar, no? of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the domestic, in the domestic realm. How she was, so, so her, her paintings was um, from the uh, masculine view was perspective was referring to the so to the houses, the, the colonial houses, more importantly, and um, it was a consequence also most importantly of the um, uh, um, of the critics. So most of our critics, not all, but most of our critics, uh, Cuban critics, are men, <laughs> also and curators are men. So that's why I say it's more a structural uh, problematic. And um, this is on one side. And then in the, from the 1950, from 1959 to the present, it is so interesting how um, 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 women artists has um, 
found ways to uh, counteract the official um, discourse through their work. Here, I was just using uh, some of the artists um, uh, on the Arte Cubano, but when I think uh, of the uh, um, work of uh, uh, Antonia Aires in the, um, in, in the 1960s, uh, how she was able not using the female body, but using, let's say, the er erotics from the, uh, if we use uh, Audre Lorde's conception of the erotics. So all the, all the raw feelings, everything that comes from, uh, a, from our interior and has been uh, negated and uh, re uh, repressed. And how she explode, it may explode all this. So I'm talking about in, uh, Antonia Iris in Cuba, how she explode uh, and, and show, uh, shown all of that on her canvases uh, is just, I would say, an early example of how um, women, um, women artists in Cuba has been, so we have a tradition of uh, female um, cultural production uh, con constantly counteracting uh, the official um, ideologies and nationalistic ideologies. So, uh, beyond that, of course, there is a lot more to say, but um, I don't know. This is some take, yeah, takes I wanted to probably to address uh, concerning your question. But if you have more precise question yeah. on this regard, please. Yes. <laughs> and I think we just have to keep looking out for your, your uh, publications, because I know that this is something you're working on. So thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think we had one question in the chat. So are the artist protesters all anti all government or against the government policies? But I think yeah. that you were also showing all protesters that were not just artists, but the artists in general have had several um, recently in the past two years protests that I think he's referencing. So uh, the question is if I okay. am preferring yeah. yeah, are the so, artist protesters all anti all government or against the government policies? Oh, that is no, it, it's impossible concerning everything about Cuba. And let's, let's start with the protests. The protests are not monolithic or neither. So not all the protesters were protesting the same, the same issues. Some of them were just protesting scarcity. Others, the uh, bad management, so the, the uh, unfortunate management of the COVID crisis, the uh, scarcity of uh, uh, health supplies. Others were just, that's why I use this uh, metaphor of the pressure cooker, because there are so many factors um, uh, com in confluence in this protest. And of course, there were others, many of them, that were anti-government, anti others that were just protesting um, some policies, but not the entire government, others against the revolution, others that were socialists. So that there, were, there were cases of um, um, young Marxist uh, uh, militants that were even arrest, arrested because they were in the protest. So there was everything. This was concerning the protest. And then this is similar with the Cuban cultural production and Cuban artists, you have everything. And uh, also what is interesting and is them in this spectrum, you have mm, several artists that managed to keep some kind of compromise between the, poly the um, um, that's why I was talking at a certain moment between, uh, about this balancing act between um, the artistic production and uh, censorship. So how they are trying to evade uh, censorship, just trying to keep some kind of compromise between the um, revolutionary ideology and their desire of um, um, make some kind of, or convey some criticism on Cuban uh, situation. This is, um, well, it, it depends uh, with, uh, with uh, um, which artists we are talking about, but others are absolutely, and. I, I think none of them are uh, included in the um, uh, Arte Cubano exhibition. So that's why I didn't talk about them. I just uh, mentioned uh, Hamlet La Bastida, but 
he's not included in the in the show, so I, I couldn't show anything from what well, I, I could have, but I didn't. Unfortunately, I should have. Um, but uh, others are direct and express the year. Um, yeah, so the the uh, the the they are discontent with the government is not implicit at all. It's explicit. So you have everything else in all Cubans. And this is why these kind of exhibitions are so important because they allow us, allows us to see that Cuba, the Cuban reality is not on white, on, white and black, um, on white and black. It's not as uh, polarized. It's polarized, but there are many other um, um, nuances in between. And we don't know that, not because, uh, so yeah, the general uh, American public do not, not do not know that not because you, <laughs> it's just because you don't you cannot know uh, because of this uh, disinformation and uh, misinformation I would say uh, that is um, nourished by uh, both uh, political poles. So I believe that we have to go beyond those uh, the, this binaries and those. Uh, sites that against, like Fidel Castro uh, said at the beginning, so we, we had in this, this slide that brought, uh, contra la revolución, oh, perdón, <laughs> con la revolución toda, contra la revolución nada. And we have to go beyond that from uh, the left uh, or the right. Okay, well, yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. And then actually, you know, being part of this exhibition gave me a chance to learn all the things I was never taught. And I really appreciated the opportunity to, to have that and to, to really look at Cuba and to understand better uh, more about it in a way that I never would have, but through the art itself. So um, I think that that's all we have for tonight, but um, I wanted to say thank you again so much. It was uh, really wonderful to have you and not in person, it would have been even more lovely, but always, happy to have you here uh, virtually. It was really wonderful and we really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure being here. I really appreciate your flexibility, uh, your invitation. First of all, Lucia, so Professor Lucia Suarez introduction and the presence of all of you. I, I am really grateful for that. Thank you so much. Thank you.